Now, <clears throat> there are many theories of vision. There is no single theory of vision that can claim to have the territory covered. We will be looking now at a lot of work done within cognitive neuroscience and cognitive psychology, in which vision is understood to be the construction of a representation of the world. We're going to have to unpack that. That's the normal way that vision is treated in the computational theory of mind, which is a very, a very widespread orthodoxy, but which cannot claim to tell the whole story. Here we'll meet such very well-known theories of vision, such as the dual stream theory of Milner and Goodale, the theory of computation and representation of David Marr, and the feature detection work of Hubel and Wiesel, work that won the Nobel Prize. So let's first ask what's going on if we talk about mental representations. If we treat the mind or the domain of present experience and the world as separate, then we have to provide a story of how it is that mind comes to know world. This is the fundamental principle behind most attempts to come up with a something like a theory of cognitive psychology. Most such accounts involve the creation of mental representations of the world, because otherwise you would have no knowledge of the world at all. Notice that these distinguish, as it were, between an exterior world and an interiority in which the representations exist. But the notion of representation is a fiercely complicated notion. It's not a sim simple unitary concept. So we need to hone our intuitions on this somewhat. And we're going to do that by beginning with a much more familiar domain, one, however, from which we can learn many of the complexities of representation. We're going to talk about maps. This is a photograph of Salt Lake City in Utah. I've never been there. I learn about it from things like photographs and maps. This is a map of Salt Lake City. You're all familiar with maps. You've used maps of various kinds, and you can immediately see that there's a lot of information on this map that might be of use if you got to Salt Lake City. Information to do with getting around, layout of the streets, principal buildings, parks, and the like. Now, there's no single way to draw a map of Salt Lake City. Consider this, which is also a map of the area around Salt Lake City. Notice what's happened to Salt Lake City itself. It has been reduced to a five-pointed star. Now, that's a bit odd. And it's even a bit odd to point it out, because as competent map users, you have no difficulty dealing with a map like this, and you know that there'll be a certain degree of convention in the symbols that are applied. A map can't be pure convention, however. To drive home the point, here's a third map of Salt Lake City, and this map happily provides a legend on the right-hand side. The scale of this map is different from the other two, the details that are brought forth are different from the other two, and there's a bunch of symbols of purely conventional intent that have to be explained. Now, every entry on this map, all the information in this map has the potential to tell us some things about Salt Lake City. But the elements of the map stand in different kinds of relationship to Salt Lake City. So, for example, some information is perfectly explicit. The names of individual places, such as Salt Lake City itself, are spelled out right there. That is, of course, explicit and also represents the conventions that adhere to the city. There's other kinds of information here too, though. If you wanted to find the distance between two points, not the distance as the crow flies, but the distance on the ground, you could take out a piece of string and you could place one end at, at your starting point, trace the other the piece of string until the other end lies at your destination, then take that piece of string and hold it against the scale, which the map conveniently provides, and that would give you the distance on the ground. Because spatial layout on the map bears a principled, non-arbitrary relationship to distances on the ground in Salt Lake City. 
So notice that there's some distinctions here. There's information that's explicit and information that's implicit. You have to work harder to get at the uh, information that's implicit. There's map elements that stand in a conventional relationship to things on the ground, as it were. And there's map elements that stand in a principle lawful relationship to things on the ground. Any of these might be called representations. Notice also that no map can capture the territory. There's always going to be an infinity of things about Salt Lake City that no map, no matter how big and detailed, can capture. This map has nothing about the smells of Salt Lake City, the sounds of Salt Lake City, the mood, their favourite music kinds. There's all kinds of things you could ask about Salt Lake City that are not and never will be on a map. Let's have a look at symbols and see that here there are also some distinctions worth learning. A symbol stands in correspondence to something else, and the symbol, the relationship between the symbol and what it stands for, is largely a matter of convention, but not entirely. So there's two possible symbols for an airport on a map. There's no right way to represent an airport on a map. And pointing to a, an aeroplane as symbolic of an airport is a kind of move we're very familiar with. The aeroplane is not entirely conventional because airplanes are found at airports. Um, so there's a great deal of convention here. Um, and there's also some meaning that goes beyond convention. The third symbol down might be found in the dashboard of your car. And if it, that light comes on, it means you need oil. The symbol there is of an oil can, but oil cans like that are, hardly exist anymore. Nobody puts oil in from an oil can like that. Here, what was originally an, an icon that, was, that looked like something that you might use has now become a symbol of purely arbitrary convention. The save button on various applications on your computer resembles a floppy disk which has gone the same way. Symbols can be entirely arbitrarily constructed. The red circle with the line through it might be understood as a generalized template for prohibition. If you put something else in there that sign means don't do it. Maybe no fishing, no walking on the grass, no feeding the animals. There's a generic sense of prohibition here, and that is purely a conventional sense. There's nothing in natural law that tells us that prohibition must be indicated with a red circle with a line through it. So these are all about something, the state of your car, the um, airports on the ground, how to behave. They're all about something. Here are two more things that are about something, and these are interestingly different from anything on that map or those symbols. On the top we see the trace left behind by some lips that kiss the glass, and below we see the imprint of a hand on some soft clay. These are imprints and they stand in correspondence to something which is not, not there anymore. There was an event which left a trace. The event is now long past, but we can find out about this absent thing by examining the trace. To this extent, they might be seen to be very similar to representations, but they arise causally. Um, there is no element of artifice or convention involved in the marks made. There may be in selecting the medium, so someone had to choose that clay or provide a pane of glass, but in the encounter between the lips or the hand and the medium, physics takes over. And so a lot of information about the past event is there, but a lot of information is missing. There's an infinity, an infinity of things we cannot find out. So we don't know whether either of these were the man or a woman, for example, or left-handed or right-handed. The trace bears a causal relationship to the originating event. Now consider that imprint of the hand in the clay. Notice that the causal structure is somewhat preserved even if we stretch the clay or compress the clay. There are various forms of topological distortion we could do to the clay, and that would leave a recognizable imprint of a hand, albeit with different proportions. And there are lots of ways to change this that cannot be reached by merely stretching and compressing. So no amount of stretching and compressing will reverse the order of the fingers, for example. 
Sometimes cuts would be needed. Remember the mappings we saw in the cortex. This is very, very similar. So representation is a complex concept. Things stand for other things or are related to absent things in very many ways. Some of them arbitrary, some of them not, some of them symbolic, um, some of them causal. Here we're going to say that something represents something else if it stands in correspondence to it and if it plays a role within a system because of the relationship of correspondence. So the word horse, for example, stands in relationship or potentially stands in relationship to an actual animal. But there's nothing in horse to suggest that. Rather, it plays that role within the system of the English language because it has that particular relationship of correspondence. Now, arbitrariness is not an all or nothing thing. So the letter, the Greek letter pi was um, taken over by mathematicians to represent the ratio of the diameter to the circumference of a circle. And that's entirely arbitrary. There's two examples of prohibition signs. They both actually mean no fishing. They chose to center different representations of fishing in there. They both succeed in communicating the message of no fishing. There's clearly no one way to signal no fishing, but there's a slightly less arbitrary relationship between the iconic images there and the letter pi with a particular number. Now, each of these symbols functions within a system. The English language is not the only system. So pi functions within the system of formal mathematics. Those prohibition signs function within an ecosystem of signs that guide the public on how to behave and what not to do. Similarly, we can examine all the elements on a map and query to what extent they stand in an arbitrary or non-arbitrary relationship to other things. Now, I'm just going to very briefly run over the cortical maps that we looked at before, which are often cited as a very important kind of representation in the brain. And I want to clearly distinguish between the sense of representation we already encountered in looking at the cortical maps from the sense of representation with great deals of arbitrariness and symbolicness that we're looking at now. So in the last time we looked at the relationship between the retina and the visual cortex, we saw that the spatial layout of the retina is retained through several transformations and synapses with the result that places that are close together on the retina project to places in primary visual cortex that are close together. There are distortions, there's stretching and compressing, but there's no arbitrary link. There's where we saw the distortions. We saw the same thing when we looked at the primary somatosensory cortex. Here there was some cutting because there's no continuous mapping possible from the surface of the skin to that gyrus. Um, uh, but the, this homunculus that we identified is very famous and it's often in cognitive neuroscience when one might hear speak of the representation of the body in primary somatosensory cortex. But I want you to understand what that word representation means there. It means there is a principled, lawful, causal mapping from the skin to the cortex. It says nothing about functions. It says nothing about interpretation. This is much more like an imprint than an element on a map. And we saw the same thing in uh, the auditory cortex here, for comparison, is the cat brain. That's why it's a bit smooth. And there is a result of stimulation that shows that the uh, various cells in primary auditory cortex are organized from right to left by frequency. All those maps are examples of, in fact, we're back at maps, right? Maps introduce so many questions about representation. These all are causal mappings. The structure of the stimulus, the structure of what's going on on the sensory surface is somewhat preserved in the pattern of neural sensitivities, much as something of the event of the hand is transferred to the clay and remains. There are inevitable distortions. This is not a simple translation. Some aspects of the what's going on are more important than others. And so we see the distortions where then somatosensory cortex is a lot of area devoted to the mouth and very little devoted to the heels. When we look at the surface of the retina, we see great concentration of cones around the fovea, and we see something completely different in the periphery. 
So those maps, we already met our representations, but we're going in the next few videos to explore a different kind of sense of representation. The cortical maps we saw are not beholden to any computational theory of mind. They are, as I said, more like imprints. But the computational theory of mind takes the notion of representation a lot further and uses um, conventional ideas of the relationship between a representation and the thing it is about. So we'll get into that.